Can you provide an overview of, um, of what the legal environment is for cooperatives generally and um, sort of what, you know, if, if someone's coming in with very little knowledge, what they should be aware of as kind of the lay of the land? Sure. Well, uh, the first thing I want to say about co-ops that might be unpalatable to some is that uh, cooperatives are corporations. And so if you're somebody who hates the fact that cooperations are people, according to the US Supreme Court, you might be able to take a little comfort in knowing that your cooperative is also a corporate person in exactly the same sense. And, and like all these corporate entities, uh, they exist as creatures of state law. So every state has its corporate law, and most states have a special statute or several special statutes under which you can incorporate under state law, and you can certainly incorporate various types of co-ops uh, in Vermont under Vermont law by filing articles of incorporation with the Secretary of State and mm -hmm. adopting bylaws that are consistent with uh, Vermont law. Um, if you want to form a co-op in Vermont, though, you don't have to incorporate in Vermont. You can pick a, another state where you think the co-op law is more congenial for some reason. Um, a lot of co-ops like to incorporate in Minnesota just because Minnesota has a lot of co-ops and so it has a well-developed body of law and a good co-op statute. Um, or you can incorporate in any number of other states and then you just have to register to do business with the Secretary of State here in Vermont. Um, all of that, though, is really just the backdrop because what really drives cooperative law, I think, is the Internal Revenue Code. You know, like so many things in American culture, what really drives human behavior is how much am I going to owe in taxes? And so it turns out that cooperatives have their very own subchapter of the Internal <laughs> Revenue Code. It's called Subchapter T. So if you get tired of calling yourself a co-op, you can say, well, I'm a T Corp. I'm a Subchapter T <laughs> corporation. And uh, Subchapter T is an elaborate mechanism that is designed to minimize the extent to which cooperatives are taxed at the entity level so that co-ops don't have to pay any income taxes. And the, um, the, the trick or the, the key is you want to be operating on what's known as a cooperative basis, according to the IRS. So what's operating on a cooperative basis? That's your next question, right? <laughs> well, this is so important that I actually printed the answer on the back of my business card. Here it is. A cooperative is a business enterprise that does three things. One, limits the financial return on capital. So co-ops can actually issue stock to people who are in it for a return, but the, uh, this is called subordination of capital. There has to be a limitation on what, how much profit you pay out that way. And in Vermont, the law is 6%. You can't pay out more than 6%. Hmm. Uh, the second characteristic of a cooperative, according to the Internal Revenue Service, it has to be democratically controlled by its member patrons, each with one vote. So you know, ExxonMobil is a democracy but each share gets one vote. So right. if you own a billion shares, you get a billion votes. I own one share, I get one vote. That's not how co-ops work. One human being, one vote. And finally, and this is the really important one, I think, uh, a co-op in order to qualify as operating on a cooperative basis with the IRS has to distribute its earnings to patrons in proportion to their business with the cooperative. So you guys know that that's the, that's, the, that's the insight that the Rochdale pioneers came up with in England in 1844 that made their co-op a success. And that is the key attribute uh, of a cooperative, according to the IRS, the, the legal term of art being patronage. Of course, at a consumer co-op, patronage is how much groceries you buy or how much other consumer goods you buy. At a worker co-op, patronage is how many, how many hours of labor do I contribute to the organization? And at a producer co-op, it's you know how many chickens or gallons of milk do I produce or mm -hmm. whatever. So that's co-op law in a nutshell. And so, um, do you have a sense of the kind of historical evolution of that at all? Kind of uh, when when you really sort of got the got that that sort of subchapter sub chapter T and all the all these structures kind of came into place. Um, was that a kind of a recent innovation? Had people been running cooperative businesses in a more unincorporated way for a long time? Uh, well, I think historically, you know, co-ops really came to be prominent in the Midwest uh, because of those uh, Lutheran bachelor farmers who came over from Finland, actually. Uh, and so co-ops started to flourish in the Midwest. And as they become, became politically influential uh, around the time of the New Deal, they were able to start uh, getting these provisions into the Internal Revenue Code uh, that make uh, help co-ops avoid taxation at around the same time that um, uh, 
the New Deal was embracing co-ops as, uh, as the way to electrify much of the middle of the United States. So Don, you mentioned um, m many cooperatives choose to incorporate in Minnesota. Um, what are some of the advantages that, um, that Minis the statute in Minnesota offers, and do you see any potential opportunities to sort of improve Vermont statute? Absolutely. Uh, what's good about Minnesota is it has a very well organized and clear cooperative statute. So, uh, because there's a hierarchy, uh, when you incorporate a co op, the, uh, you have to comply with the state uh, statute of the state you're incorporated in, and then you have to comply with your articles of organization, which is the document you file with the Secretary of State, and then below that is the bylaws, and mm -hmm. they're successively harder to amend. It's fairly easy to amend the bylaws, harder to amend your articles of incorporation, uh, organization, and then in order to amend the statute, you have to get the legislature to do it for you and then have the governor sign it into law. So what Minnesota has is just a very well-written, clear uh, statute that allows co-ops uh, just enough flexibility to do what they want to do around raising capital and organizing themselves, but enough certainty and predictability so that, um, so that you know what you're getting and you aren't starting a corporate entity without knowing how the law is going to treat you. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Vermont, I think, is more typical of uh, states, our co-op uh, statutes kind of developed gradually over time as people thought about co incorporating different kinds of co-ops. So we have sort of an overarching cooperative statute that was really written with um, agricultural producer co-ops and to some extent consumer co-ops in mind, but it's a bit of a patchwork and it's hard to understand and there's a lot of gaps in it. And then we have a separate statute that covers electric co-ops. Uh, we have another statute that covers worker co-ops, and we have yet another statute that covers housing co-ops. And so it's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a patchwork, I would say. Um, just like every uh, traditional stock corporation that's publicly traded in America is incorporated in Delaware, because Delaware is considered to have a very congenial set of corporate laws and statutes, I, I'd like to see Vermont become the Delaware of co-ops. Uh, because because I, I really think that we're the cooperative state. I mean, Minnesota likes to think of itself as the cooperative state, but my theory is per capita, we're more cooperatized than they are. And, and we're a small state, so it's relatively easy to, uh, to get things done at the state house in Montpelier, because um, everybody knows their legislature, and because co-ops are totally consistent with the public policy of the state. You know, our governor is the cooperator in chief. You know, the Peter Shumlin, they caught him on camera at uh, the uh, Putney Food Co-op that he's belonged to since he was a babe in arms. Yeah. They just walked up to him, shoved the camera in his face, and he rattled off this very intelligent disquisition about cooperatives. I will mm -hmm. wager that very few other governors around the, around the country can do that. So when you, um, when you sort of put forward this aspiration of us becoming the, uh, uh, the Delaware of cooperatives, um, what sorts of, um, what sorts of Things if you if you were the one you know writing writing that reform of the current statutes, what what would you do to improve it? Well, I would um, make sure that it's very clear as a matter of Vermont law what is or is not a co-op. I mean, it's uh, as I mentioned earlier, really right now it's the Internal Revenue Code that's driving what defines a co-op. Um, I think cooperators and people who are served by co-ops deserve to know what it means so that if you walk into a store that's called the co-op food store or the Onion River co-op, you actually know what that entity really is and it's not something else that's just calling itself a co-op. So we need to be very clear about that. We need to provide co-ops though with a certain measure of flexibility, particularly around how they're organized and how they raise capital. Um, I think we need a measure of transparency. Uh, so that members of co-ops can feel like the co-op really belongs to them and their co-op doesn't function as a black box because that's bad for cooperation. Yeah. And then I think we need to, uh, we also need to make changes in securities law here in Vermont in order to make it easier uh, for co-ops to raise capital from their members in particular. So what, um, so right now if for, for co-op raising capital, um, what, are the, what are the limitations placed on that by the, by the law in Vermont? Well, uh, the Federal Securities and Exchange Act defines a security, and you don't want to be a security, or you don't want the financial instrument you're issuing to be a security, because if it is, 
you have to go through a really onerous process of developing prospectuses and registering the security and there are all these rules about who you can offer the security uh, for sale to, mm -hmm. all of that kind of stuff. And if you are offering that security for sale in more than one state, then you're probably running up against federal securities law and the need to register with the SEC. If you're just uh, selling your security as a co-op in Vermont and you're only talking to people in Vermont, then you still have to comply with the state securities law. And even at the state level, securities registration is really onerous. Why do we have these requirements? Well, we adopted them in the 1930s because uh, the stock market crash was created or uh, caused in large part by scoundrels who were peddling fraudulent security. So we put all these regulatory procedures in place to prevent that. But co-ops are swept in and you know, even though a cooperative exists to serve its members and not, uh, not make anybody wealthy, um, they tend to get swept into securities law. Happily, there is a case that the U.S. Supreme Court decided, uh, called Revis, I think, uh, that says that when a cooperative sells shares to people in connection with their becoming members, so when you make your required capital investment in a cooperative just in order to become a member, that transaction is not covered by federal securities law. It doesn't meet the definition of a security under the Securities and Exchange Act because it's clear that the person investing isn't investing in the co-op in order to maximize return the way other investors do. Uh, and so it's not a security as defined by federal law. And most states, including Vermont, use the same definition of a security in state law as the Congress did in the federal securities law. So, so joining your co-op, buying member shares, not a security, no registration requirements. Everything else, including member loan programs, arguably do implicate securities law, and that's very complicated and unpleasant. And so, um, what what you know when uh, when a co-op does does want to raise capital for for its you know an expansion or founding, um, what options are available to it under the current regime? Well, I still think that a member loan program is the easiest and most straightforward thing to do. Uh, who are the people that are most likely to want to loan money to their cooperative? The, the members. And oftentimes members have uh, wealth that they can invest. And I think if you look at the uh, history of cooperatives, particularly here in Vermont, you'll find that um, co-ops are uh, a sound investment compared to other kinds of business corporations. I should say we have a bigger problem than just funding co-ops. It's very hard for local economies to amass capital because of the way the securities laws are, are written. And of course, Congress passed a crowdfunding statute in order to make that a little bit easier. But the Securities and Exchange Commission hasn't finalized its rules yet, so we don't know uh, how that will play out. I think that, that mechanism will benefit co-ops so that if you're if you follow certain rules and do something on a fairly small scale, I think it's a $500,000 limit. Co-ops will be able to raise money that way. Um, and um, then, uh, of course, there are other mechanisms by which co-ops can actually take on outside investors. And as long as you don't give them voting rights, you still meet the definition of a co-op, according to the IRS and most state laws. And then a lot of states have adopted uh, these limited cooperative association statutes that actually allow uh, entities to form corporations that call themselves co-ops, basically, but actually have a class of members who are just investors. And that statute typically says that as long as those investors don't become a majority of the seats on the board of directors or uh, the, vote, the voting shares, then that's OK. We, I should say, we adopted that statute here in Vermont, but uh, we went to the legislature, I and a couple of other people, and said, you know, this is all well and good. It's a great statute, but this new kind of entity isn't really a cooperative because uh, entities that, have th that, that are potentially controlled in significant part by outside investors aren't really consistent with the cooperative principles. And so we persuaded the legislature in Vermont to allow those entities to exist. But here in Vermont, they're called mutual benefit enterprises. And we strengthened the law in Vermont around what can call itself a co-op so that if you have outside investors, I would say it's difficult to call yourself a co-op unless you're really organized like one. Have you seen the um, mutual benefit um, statute um, 
help co-ops raise capital? Has that played out? Uh, I have not, but the co-ops that I tend to uh, interact with are at a relatively small scale. I think it's fair to say that the uh, Limited Cooperative Association Act uh, was, f was written uh, in order to help uh, larger agricultural co-ops. Mm. Um, and so can you talk a little bit more about that, that question of, um, of, you know, you said this law was passed that really put forward the, the, a stronger definition of what, what is and isn't a cooperative and what, or what can and cannot legally call itself a cooperative. Um, what, like, what is kind of, what, what are some, some more of the details of that and how has, has that been used to specifically kind of call out orga any organizations that have been um, maybe abusing the cooperative brand or mark or what have you? Well, uh, not to my knowledge. This is a fairly recent phenomenon in Vermont. And um, I, I, it's pretty clear that if you were just a conventional business and for some reason you use the word cooperative in your name, this, this comes up occasionally and the Secretary of State will tell you that you cannot register your business under that name in Vermont because of the way our law is written. Um, but to my knowledge, I don't think there have been any, been any examples of organizations that are sort of but not really cooperatives uh, getting into trouble with the Secretary of State. And I think um, hopefully that will happen re relatively infrequently because we want, uh, we, we want all the co-ops in, in the state to actually act like co-ops, organize themselves like co-ops, and, um, and not get into trouble. So recently in Vermont we had the um the issue around the healthcare, um, I guess it's not a cooperative, but it's a consumer owned and oriented plan, so they get to use the acronym co-op. That's a very interesting phenomenon because what you just described, Eric, is something that was included in the Affordable Care Act. And you know, in the Byzantine deliberations that led to the, you know, just barely passed Affordable Care Act. Uh, one of the uh, things that emerged was, in, you know, as, a, as an alternative to like government-run uh, health maintenance organizations, they authorized these organizations called consumer, I think it's consumer organized and oriented plans. Cleverly, that is, you know, the initials form the word co-op. And so, you know, because federal law preempts state law, uh, I think the fact that those or organizations were allowed to organize under the Affordable Care Act and get lots of money from the federal government and call themselves co-op, capital C, capital O, hyphen, capital O, capital P, I think they would have been allowed to, uh, well, it, it would have been very difficult for us as, as a matter of state law to tell an organization like that in Vermont that it couldn't call itself the health co-op. And you'll notice the one that tried to form itself here in Vermont always spelled that word, C-O-O-P, in capital letters. That, that's right. because that's the way it appears in the Affordable Care Act. And um, I was wondering if you, know, you, you might want to give a little bit of your thoughts on sort of the way that organization, the trajectory of that organization in Vermont, um, you know, it, it basically had a, uh, it, it launched, it attempted to, um, had attempted to start doing business, and the regulator kind of um, came down on it. What, what, what were your thoughts on that, that episode? Uh, it, it was our state Department of Financial Regulation that decided not to grant uh, a charter to the Vermont Health Co-op, and it was concerned about the way the, uh, the co-op was organized. You know, there, was, uh, there were issues around self-dealing, and, uh, you know, I, I, I think without, I don't know the people that formed the Vermont Health Co-op, so I have no opinion about them personally, and I don't have any reason to think they were proceeding in bad faith, but what they were creating wasn't a cooperative. And it was, uh, you know, there was a sort of self-perpetuating board of directors and, and a lot of opportunity for doing things that are, I would say more resemble a conventional wealth maximizing business. And that troubled the financial regulators in the state, and so they were not chartered, and I guess they gave up after that. Um, and so, one other thing, just kind of from the perspective of you, having recently gone into gone into the practice of cooperative law, um, what are the sorts of issues that, as a as an attorney, um, kind of the cooperatives sort of need need your kind of services for? Well, uh, co-ops need to figure out where and how they're going to incorporate, under which statute, in which state. 
how to draft articles of organization that are consistent. If you read the Vermont statute, you'll see there are certain provisions that the law says have to be in your articles of incorporation. Uh, and then you want to draft bylaws that describe a cooperative uh, form of doing business. Uh, what, one thing you want to be really careful about is making sure that your bylaws create an organization that takes advantage of the uh, provisions in subchapter T of the Internal Revenue Code. And there you get into these Byzantine things called qualified and unqualified written notices of allocation. Basically, you want to make sure that every time you take your net earnings and you either pay them out in cash to the members or you allocate them to the members by issuing shares to them or adding to their capital accounts, you want to make sure that you qualify those allocations for non-taxation to the co-op so that you want to pass the tax obligation on to the members. Uh, and there's an elaborate process that you have to use in order to make sure that that happens. And the nice thing about what, what happens when you do that is that if you're a consumer co-op and you allocate the tax liability to members, uh, the members don't have to pay any income tax because when patronage refunds are paid to individual consumers on consumer goods, the, re the patronage refunds are not taxable to the consumer. So you, if, you're, if you're shopping at the uh, food co-op here in Burlington, you will never, as long as you're buying your own groceries and not buying groceries for your company, you'll never have to pay income tax on your patronage refund. Hmm. Unless they change the Internal Revenue Code and abolish that, which I doubt they will do. So um, before we leave the, the, the co-op law piece, um, we were talking earlier about statutes in Vermont. And Vermont has um, had a bit of an appetite to um, create statutes that target certain industries, for instance, the, the captive insurance business. Do you sense that there's any appetite in Vermont to, um, to, re to revisit the, uh, the cooperative statutes? Well, I have that appetite. <laughs> uh, and I, I think that when we succeed in forming our statewide association of Vermont co-ops, we'll be able to get together and, and agree on the way that we would like our cooperative statute to look. And I think we would all like Vermont to be the cooperative state. Mm -hmm. And I think one way of doing that is making Vermont a very attractive state for cooperatives to incorporate in. I have a specific idea. I would like to see Vermont become, if not the Delaware of co-ops generally, the Delaware of what some people call multi-stakeholder co-ops and mm -hmm. what I like to call solidarity co-ops. And those are co-ops that have different groups of members, the ones that I know about are co-ops that have a group of employee members and a group of consumer members. So you right. can start a food co-op that's owned jointly by both its employees and its consumers. And I think that's a pretty compelling form of organizing a co-op. Uh, it, it starts to get at a lot of the labor issues that tend to be said consumer co-ops. And it's an emerging form of cooperative organization. Uh, the province of Quebec has a solidarity co-op statute that I believe works pretty well if you happen to be a Canadian co-op. Uh, so we need, a, we need an American counterpart. And we are just the state to do that. <laughs>